Grinder Deloche and Associates presents Dr. John Grinder demonstrating content-free trance work. We will now join Dr. Grinder at the Grinder Deloche and Associates Hypnosis Certification Seminar. You are a sophisticated operator in the same game that I am. You have found yourself in a situation where there's a choice that you wish to complete, a, a project that you've been working on for some period of time. And your question is, would I be of assistance in this? And my answer is, I would be happy to help you in finding the resources necessary to do this. Um, as far as I'm concerned, you can listen with both conscious and unconscious process. Or, if your unconscious believes it would be more useful for the reorganization to occur without your conscious being present, I leave that choice entirely in the hands of your unconscious. I myself have no preferences in this matter. <laughs> so find comfort where you need to find comfort, but an alertness in the comfort that allow you to make a full record of what ensues. Pleasure, once again, to be granted access to a very sophisticated, powerful, unconscious mind. You have, in your lifetime, accomplished many interesting things. You've requested me assistance in completing a project which you have been occupied with for some period of time. It is obvious to me that you have the resources necessary. The issue becomes, at what price? <clears throat> Early in your personal history, you had an experience of completing a project much like the one you're occupied with now but it was at a great personal cost. It was a project that while at points may have been inherently satisfying, and the result that you achieved by its completion was both personally and professionally an advance for you. It was done in such a way that at that point your unconscious mind made a decision support a promise that you made consciously that is never again. I want you to consider of all the women that you know who best could serve as a model for how to release a child, once the child has grown to the point where they are autonomous and you have offered them all you have to offer, recognizing that they come at some point to have a life of their own. The fact that you offered them experiences you used all the resources that you could muster during their upbringing in such a fashion that you gave to them what at that point in time you had to give is not a statement that they represent what you're able to do now but that as of the time and the place that you came to recognize their autonomy and let them fly free. That was the best you were able to muster at that point. Your hope as a parent is always that you gave them enough that they will go well beyond what it is that they achieved 
at the point that he released them. When a carpenter creates a cabinet, the cabinet does not represent the carpenter. It only represents what the carpenter is able to produce at that point in his development as a carpenter. The carpenter releases this product to the world with the hopes it will be recognized as a fine crafted piece of work, but that it does not represent any longer than the point at which he releases it, what he's capable of at that point in time. I spent a year at Rockefeller University as a guest research investigator, had the good fortune to work with a man named Paul Postel. Postel was the leading syntactician in the field that I was graduate student in. Together we wrote a series of papers. The night before we were to submit the major paper to the major journal, I stayed up all night searching to discover if I could find counterexamples to the particular work that we had done together. I was horrified in the middle of the night to discover that I could generate several classes, counterexample, to the thesis that we had used as a focal argument in our paper. I went in early to the office and waited with patience for Postal to arrive. When he arrived, I explained to him what I had discovered. In my surprise, he looked at me and said, of course, there are counterexamples. The paper that we're going to go ahead and publish after we submit to this journal is an example of our best effort to think through these problems given our limited resources at this point in time. I will continue to change and develop my own thoughts. I will, in a sense, be freed of the thesis that we've entertained in this particular paper as soon as that I've made it available to the rest of the investigative community for whom it will serve as a spur. It is important to understand said Postal, that I have never published a paper to which I did not have solid counterexamples. No production of mine, I am intelligent enough to understand, will ever be the final word, but more important than its accuracy is the effect it has in stimulating response from the world. My wife Judith Ann in her production of her master's thesis, one of the most interesting papers I've written, hesitated after she had completed all but the summary to turn this paper in to the master's committee. I had read it. I thought it was a brilliant piece of work. And for a long time, she hesitated. Since you know her, you can make rather deep guesses about what it was that was preventing her from completing it. And what it was, was the fact that as soon as she sat down and wrote out the date and the place where her thinking in this paper had stopped for purposes of publication. She recognized that just as your child is different than you and the carpenter's cabinet is not the carpenter, 
that the arguments, information, thoughts that she had been successful in developing in her paper were not her. They were simply a way of stimulating from the world a class of responses which included responses not only of respect and admiration, but responses which would force her to continue to develop her own thoughts far beyond those that she had noted in that paper. The question of how one finishes something is at least as important as the question of how one begins it. I've mentioned to you one of the most powerful parts of my experience in Bali was the discovery that for the Balinese they receive as part of their cultural training as much instruction in how to terminate a relationship, a piece of music, a piece of art, as they are taught to initiate. The question of finishing things is as well studied there as it is the beginning of things. When I was spending a lot of time with the man who we both found to be such a powerful influence in our lives, Dr. Erickson, I would each time I left him secure a commitment from him by presupposition that we would again meet. I was reluctant to leave his presence until I had received a congruent agreement from him that we would meet again. The importance of this was to reassure myself that I could go further and would have access to his genius again. In my own life, I've discovered that I cannot complete a project until I have selected my next target. To complete a project without a succeeding challenge being available is ridiculous. Not only is it ridiculous, it's very, very hard to do. The words on the page, the paint on the canvas, the movement of a dancer's body, the sound of an instrument used with subtlety and power, the elegance of an athlete, smoothness of such movement, are but momentary frozen glimpses of a longer process. Some famous man from China once said, life is a journey of 10,000 leagues. But the wise person understands that it's complete at each step. Your unconscious mind has certain responsibilities in supporting your activities in the external world. It knows better than I what specific arrangements need to be made to allow you to move to the next steps. And it is correct in defeating any attempt on your conscious mind's part to do so until you have selected what paths will lead 
from the completion of that step. We'd be interested in having your unconscious mind spend a few moments in considering the proposals both over and over which have been made and then indicate by a honest movement of your right hand for a yes and your left for a no whether it has found what it considers to be an equitable solution which allows a continuation of your journey of creativity. A solution that's equitable to all parties concerned.
as you continue to amplify that response so as to make it entirely definitive, I'd like to offer you a slight treat. This should be entertainment to you, but entertainment that enhances rather than interferes with the important process you're engaged in now. And that is, you've heard my suggestions and proposals and metaphors with response to what you requested. But how interesting it would be to compare those with the proposals, suggestions, metaphors that Dr. Erickson would have used had he been sitting here now. That's right. Listen. What does it mean to have time on your hands?
surprised by the things you've never seen before. You find the damnedest things <laughs> in the damnedest places. Is <laughs> Hard to believe, but <laughs> there it is. Yes, yeah. thank, thank me and yeah. thank you. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> Close. Close. <laughs> <laughs> That's for you, personal, right? Uh, folks, um, I'll leave you with your own responses and hallucinations for the evening about what the content was. I'll be interested if you have guesses tomorrow. Of course, the guesses really belong to each of you. And the guesses that you make are the ones that are most appropriate for your perceptions of what happened here and how it would be meaningful to you. Um, I will say this much. Uh, you had the opportunity to watch what I consider to be the optimal relationship between an operator and a subject in that the subject did 99.9% .9 of the work. <laughs> <coughs> And when you're dealing with uh, someone as resourceful and as sophisticated as Norma Beretta, uh, it would be inappropriate to do any more than what I did. For further information on videotapes, audiotapes, books, seminar information, contact Grinder, Delosier & Associates, 110 Kenny Court, Santa Cruz, California, 95065 or phone, area code 408-475-8540.